All right. Well, I don't want to waste your time, so we can uh, we can get our discussion started with these two. Hopefully, we have some others trickling in. I know a few of them did text me they had work today and felt really bad. One of them sent me a few questions, so we yeah, no worries. We'll uh, we'll at least get them get them some info to to go off of. Um, <laughs> and and uh, share this with them later but billy thank you so much for jumping on here i can't thank you enough this is awesome for us yeah no, um, no problem. we really appreciate it so i'll just i'll turn it over to you to start uh, maybe introduce yourself your background and maybe even talk a little bit about today ali had a rough first match and then a roller coaster of a second match there but <laughs> yeah um yeah so my name's billy heiser um I grew up in the Chicago area. Um, I moved to Florida to train uh, for tennis when I was about 14. And then um, I actually I went and tried to play pro out of uh, high school before I went to college. And then um, I had a pretty bad injury. So I ended up going to University of Illinois. And the plan was always just to go there for a semester for a year and then go back and play pro. And um, I ended up just playing there for three years um, I left my senior year and started a tennis academy in Chicago with some juniors, um, and that's kind of how I got coaching. And um, from there, I coached junior tennis for probably about four years, um, had some success with some good junior players that got to number one in the country in their age groups, and um, pretty much all of them went on to play Division One tennis, um, quite a few at Illinois where I played. Um, and uh, from there, then I got to look to work with the professional player. The um, first player coach, his name was Tim Smichek, and I coached him for about five years and then um, worked with Dennis Kudla and Tennis Sangren from there. Um, and then um, worked with Rajiv Ram, Sam Groth um, for a couple of years, and now working with Allison Risk and Dominic Kupfer. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And yeah, yeah Austin Risk had it. Sorry, what was that? Oh, I just said that's kind of my coaching background. Yeah, that's awesome. You've worked with some some big time players and, and done some great things. Um, so yeah, Allison Risk had a um, couple of matches earlier today. Yeah. Um, I didn't get a chance to watch. Uh, you know, I'm currently working. You didn't um, miss him. <laughs> The, the first match looked a little rough from what I saw, but the second match looked, uh, I mean, it was 4-0 or 0-4, 4-0, and then a tie break in the third, right? Yeah, so first match just, um, actually, her, probably, her level is probably a little better in the first match, just not as sharp as she needed to be against Isla, who came out playing pretty well. And then um, against Amanda in the second match, she um, just got off to a rough start and then uh, was actually up. 4 0 uh, 4 0 3 0 serving and um, lost serve, serving for it at 3 0, lost serve again, serving for it at 3 2. Um, they play tiebreaker at 3 all. She ended up saving two match points and then winning um, what was it, 8 6 in the tiebreaker. So, yeah, a bit of a roller coaster and um, just weird. Like, this whole time for them has been really strange. Like, yeah. They haven't played a match since. Um, it would have been Dubai, so before Indian Wells. Um, and then we flew from the Middle East to Indian Wells, and, and that's when we found out it was going to be canceled when we got there. Um, and then we've kind of just been at home, not really training until this UTR event popped up a couple of weeks ago. So we started hitting and training about 10 days ago. Um, so definitely pretty rusty, um, physically not as good as she usually is. Um, but good to get back out there and just, you know, kind of taste a little bit of competition again. Yeah, absolutely. That, that probably does feel really good. Um, okay, we got a couple more jumping in here. Sure. Um, so so I, how do you want to work this? Do you want me to kind of run through the questions that we talked about before? Do you have kind of th everything lined up? What's easiest no, for you? Yeah, no, just if, whatever questions you want to ask, ask, and I'll, and I'll answer as best I can. Great. Sounds good. So um, I'm glad Trenton jumped on. Trenton's kind of got his eyes here set on on college tennis um, okay. in the future for him. Um, 
So I wanted to hear a little bit. It's it sounds like as you kind of introduced yourself there, it sounds like Illinois wasn't really necessarily a playing plan for you, or at least a long term plan initially for you. But was there anything that kind of went into that college decision and and what you were looking for in a college to play for? Oh. There's an answer I should give that you probably want your uh, team to hear. <laughs> but if I'm being very honest with you, at the time I was, fr I was obviously from the Chicago area, and um, my plan was always to go um, to Pepperdine and just go there for a semester because I really liked that coach at the time. The coach I was working with in juniors had played at Pepperdine. His name's Kelly Jones. Um, Kelly got to number one in the world in doubles, had a great collegiate career, um, coached Marty Fish for a long time. Coach Xavier Melise had a lot of good coaching accolades. And so I kind of, he had wanted me to go to Pepperdine for a semester and then go back and, and turn pro again. And uh, I ended up choosing Illinois because um, the girl I was dating at the time was going to Illinois, to be totally honest. There you go. <laughs> uh, so obviously I was recruited by Illinois as well, being from Chicago and um, Illinois had a top program. So it wasn't like a bad you know choice for me by any means, but that that honestly was the, the the reason I took a look at it and then um once I got there it was I mean I, it was the right fit for me no question the coaches were great the guys on the team were great um we all push each other well um and we had a good team we lost in the finals of NCAAs we lost in the semis one year um so we had two good really runs um uh, at a national championship, just didn't quite get it done, but um, I'm happy I chose Illinois in the end, for sure. Awesome, awesome. Um, so in college, you're playing singles and doubles. Do you did you prefer one over the other? I and mean, what's your you've coached both as well? What's your favorite? I, yeah, um, man, probably in college, uh, um, I was higher ranked in doubles than I was in singles. Um, I got to two in the country in doubles and I got to, I think it was around 20 in the country in singles. Um, so I probably enjoyed doubles a bit more just because I felt like I was a little bit better at it. And um, it, we were, we had a good doubles point at Illinois. So we we could always get off to a good start there. And then um, on tour coaching, it's, um, it's a little easier to make an impact in doubles. I feel as a coach because you can really clean things up with your team and you can, um, gain tactical advantages if you know how to you know if you can you know consistently run your plays at a really high level and then scout against what other teams maybe don't do well and what you do well you can really kind of um, find edges that way so it was, it was interesting coaching doubles compared to singles where on the men's side singles is very physical and it's almost a physical sport first um, and then kind of the tactics come into play you know maybe even third or fourth like it's not as important in men's singles um, but then in women's tennis it's back to being a little bit more tactical so there's a good variety for sure awesome yeah it's it's fun coaching both and and yeah. uh, I agree with what you're saying about doubles it is fun to kind of to implement those plays and and kind of try and gain that tactical advantage especially at high school where a lot of coaches don't do that so yeah definitely. it's fun and I think doubles will make you a better singles player for sure. Yeah. Oh boy, I can't wait to share that with Mona. That line yeah. right there, our number one girl loves singles, hates doubles. So I can't wow. wait to share that one line. Yeah, I mean, just there's a reason why a lot of the top players, men and women, play doubles at Indian Wells every year. It's because it's the um, it's generally their first tournament coming back since Australia. Um, it's on a bit of a uh, out in in the desert. It's a little bit of a strange surface. They play with a very light ball. It's a very slow court. So it kind of, um, it's in altitude, it's dry weather. So the ball moves through the air very fast, but it's very slow off the bounce. And so it, it takes a little bit of getting used to it. And so a lot of those guys play doubles to get acclimated to the conditions and get more serve and return reps. And um, they're, they're doing it to, to make sure their singles is sharp. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of players that play doubles to stay sharp in singles for sure. Oh, that's awesome. Makes a lot of sense. Um, 
so kind of in line with that that preparation idea you know there's there's the playing doubles to get ready for singles but any match that you play there's a lot of preparation that goes into it um so how in your experience from what you've seen what you experience as a player now as a coach how do the best players treat practices and treat match preparation um yeah, the best players definitely take it. Um, they got a pretty big picture mindset, so they're, they're constantly trying to improve and work on things in practice. Um, not focused on necessarily winning practice matches as they are to trying new things and trying to add skills to their game that they could implement um, in, in real matches. But they, the intensity that pros practice at is probably the most impressive thing that you'll see. And it's not great if you go to a pro tournament and watch the practice court because most of the time those guys are – the work is already done. They're, they're showing up to that tournament already having put in a lot of the hard, intense work, and they're getting there, and everything's kind of winding down in terms of the hours on court, the intensity on court, because they're trying to save their bodies and their minds to, to win – you know, make deep runs in tournaments and win a lot of matches. So you do see guys at tournaments – it does look maybe a little bit more lighthearted and a little bit more fun, a little more relaxed, but that's just the nature of them trying to wind down to make sure that they're ready to, uh, to play and peak when they need to. Um, the most intense you'll see guys at tournaments will be guys who lose early um, and they're sticking around that site, practicing, getting ready for the next event. You know, so Indian Wells, you lose early in Indian Wells, you stay there for about 10 days, and then you head to Miami. So those guys who have lost are back in training, trying to get ready. So that would be show showcase a little bit more intensity. But um, during a tournament, it's a lot of, you know, cooling down, staying fresh, finding the ball, finding your rhythm. Um, you win a match, you have tech, you usually have a day off in between. So that day off is also pretty light. It's nothing crazy. Um, but during practice weeks and dedicated training blocks, there's a big ramp up intensity, no question. Awesome. Thank you. Um, when you get into a match, what, what should players be watching for during a match? And maybe what should they not worry about until afterward when they're talking to, to a coach, what should players be focused on both in singles and doubles? What should they be looking for? The players that are playing the match or for yeah. like, if your team is watching the matches on TV. No, if you're on court playing a match, what should the player be watching um, for? Yeah, so there's there's different types of players who like to take in information from what their opponents are doing and analyze it and then kind of on the fly create a new game plan or adjust their tactics. And there's players who that distracts them and it, it, they, they can't comprehend that way. They don't concentrate that way. So they need to focus on themselves and play their game. And they have, you know, different themes that they can go through to try and um, – help them navigate against different opponents. And that's all kind of predetermined. You know, if you're struggling with A, let's try B, and it's kind of an automatic where it's not, okay, I'm struggling with A, what do I do now? And come up with a plan on the fly and then implement it. it it's an already decided plan. Um, and so there's always two types of different athletes who like to analyze on the fly and then who, who don't like to analyze on the fly. So, um, yeah, you just have to know who you're coaching, know how they operate, know what, what gives them clarity um, versus what you know, plows their mind and uh, kind of adjust how you coach them according to you know, how they are. That uh, makes sense. So with the with the WA Tour and you being able to have some on-court coaching moments, mm -hmm. what what do those conversations sound like when, when you are on court in the middle of a match? What, what is that conversation like? Yeah, it it depends. When I first started with Ali, it was the first Ali was the first female I, I had ever coached, and so I'd never coached a female before Ali. And so there's definitely a learning curve to learning the intricacies of women's tennis compared to men's tennis. Um, learning her personality um, took me a bit as well. And um, I remember I used to go on court with like an idea of what I wanted to say, and then she would communicate something back to me, and it would completely throw me off guard like I didn't think her head was in that space and I would have to like throw an audible on the fly and come up with something new to tell her because 
what she had said to me just was completely irrelevant to what I was saying to her. And uh, so I learned quickly to try and go out there and have a few different ideas of where her head could be and kind of ask her, you know, what she's feeling and then kind of go from there. So that was, that was an adjustment I had to make. Um, but a lot of the conversations are mainly about trying to get her to lock back in mentally, trying to use her best thoughts, trying to keep her calm, um, letting her know that she's doing a good job and she's okay and that she's going to work the problem, um, give herself that freedom to, to work the problem, whatever it is, um, not to panic and, and rush and use negative thoughts to cloud her mind. And so it's a lot of positive reinforcement about trying to get her mind back locked in. Um, and then, you know, as the match goes on and, and I feel like she's in a good space and she calls me out, then we can start to make maybe some tactical changes and things like that. But I think getting her locked in in her correct mindset first is the most important thing by far. No, that's good advice there. Good, uh, good approach. I like, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'd love to just hear some story I, and hopefully these, you know, these kids do too, but I'd love to hear just if you have any stories that come to mind of, of things you've experienced on tour with, with these players, um, whether it's funny moments, awesome moments, just, is there anything that comes well, to mind that you'd like to share with us? Um, Chaz, you're first on my screen on the left. Who's your favorite player? And I'll try and come up with a story about that player. I guess Roger Fed Federer, I guess. Okay, so when I was coaching Tim Smichek, he well, I first started coaching Tim. He was about 220 in the world, and um, he ended with his career high. Um, I think it was 58 or 68. So he had, he had a, quite a good career, um, spent a lot of years in the top 100. Um, it was the first U.S. Open I'd have, I was ever at as a coach. Tim qualified for the very first time at a Grand Slam. So first time he ever qualified for a Slam, the first time I was with him, it was at the US Open, which is awesome. Um, he won a, a, a really long, hard-fought match in the final round qualies. And um, so that at the US Open, you play final round qualies on a Friday. They have Arthur Ashe Kids Day on a Saturday. They have a practice day Sunday, and the main draw starts on Monday. So you have three days busy basically two days to do whatever you need to do. Um, we were going out on Arthur Ashe early Saturday before kids day started to hit with James Blake. So Tim's getting to hit on Arthur Ashe stadium now with James Blake, who is a top American, but we all knew James cause we live in Tampa together and trained with him. So that was very familiar practice. Um, we are walking out on to Arthur Ashe as Feder is finishing his practice. And um, so we walk over, Obviously, James and Roger know each other really well. I, I would, Obviously, me and Tim know who Roger is, but we don't expect Roger to know who we are at all. Like, Tim wasn't in the top 100 yet, just qualified for his first Grand Slam. And uh, Roger came straight over to Tim and goes, hey, I heard this was your first time qualifying for a Slam. That's amazing. Well done. Congratulations. Um, Billy, I heard James was saying you've been working with Tim now for a bit, and he's made huge improvements. That's unreal. Like, good job guys. And like, it was such a surreal moment that a guy like that would one know that Tim had qualified, um, care to even come over and say hello and introduce himself. So it just goes to show the type of guy that Roger is. He's, he is what you see on TV. He's a very special, special guy for the game. That's awesome. Yeah. I, uh, I held a grudge against Roger for a lot of years cause I was an Andy Roddick fan, but <laughs> he, uh, Man, he just seems like the greatest, just a great human being. Oh, he says hello every time I see him, says hi, like most friendly person you, you could. What, like, you, like I said, what you see is what you get with him. He's, he's like that with everybody, just super friendly guy. That's awesome. Um, um, and then, Trenton, you're next on my screen. Who's your favorite? No, I was going to say also him. So, also, well, come, give me a different player then. <laughs> um, I'll try to think of another Roger story, but that was the first one that came to mind. Uh, is it? Uh, uh, Nadell? Rafa? Yeah. Um, Rafa. See, I've, I've actually interacted with him quite often, so there's quite a few. I'm trying to just pick one that wouldn't be good. 
Um, yeah, I'll tell I'll tell you too. So one year in Australia, um, t- I was coaching Tim. Um, still at the time, he had he was already at this time he was probably 16 in the world, so kind of cemented himself on tour. Everyone now he's been around for a while. People knew who he was and. This was third round of Australian Open, and Tim was playing Rafa on Rod Laver, um, the matinee match. So not the night match, but the third on during the day session. And that's usually where they try and play their marquee match because it's good for TV times all over the world. And so they put Rafa and Tim out there. And um, Tim ends up losing 8-6 in the fifth set in an absolute epic match against Rafa. And um, late in the last game with Rafa serving, um, I don't know if you got you could you can look this up on YouTube because it, it was a big moment in Tim's career. Um, Rafa threw up a ball. He's serving for the match, and um, there's a second serve, and someone yells out in the crowd, and Rafa missed the serve to double fault, and um, so that would have put him. I think it would have put him down 15-30 serving for the match, and uh, Tim gave him said let you know said hey Rafa take two like that distracted you type of thing, and so you know crowd went nuts and Rafa said thanks for that and ends up winning the point and goes on the hold but the sportsmanship that Tim showed in that you know huge moment was pretty special for him and obviously special for Rafa to the point where his team made an effort all year long to nominate Tim for sportsmanship of the year with the ATP and um, the following year in Australia um Tim wanted to give his, there's this uh, good picture of Tim and Rafa at the net kind of embracing after the match. And um, Tim wanted to get the picture autographed for his mom to put in their house. And so we went up to Rafa and asked and Rafa signed the front and then flipped over on the back and wrote this really long personal note about what that moment meant to him as a competitor and how it inspired him as a competitor that there's, because he always kind of holds himself to a really high standard. And so he just kind of wrote, a little note about what it meant to him as well to have another competitor do something like that in that big of a moment. So again, Rafa, one of the best competitors of all time, in my opinion, and just very, you know, class, high class individual. Very cool. Um, Who else do we have here? I only see four. Are there more on? I might have to. Isaac and Kayla are on here as well. All right. Yeah. So one of you go with your favorite player. I mean, I don't know. I don't really watch professional tennis. I just did high school tennis as a hobby. But um, Isaac just started this year, so he's he's a couple months into the sport. To be honest with you, oh, I don't yeah. I don't really watch professional tennis on TV either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm. I honestly have no clue. Just like I don't know who are some players. That's all right. I'm I'm give Kayla. Yeah, we'll give Kayla here. Uh, one of my favorites would probably be Maria Sharapova. I think that's how you say her last name. Yeah. But I like the way she plays. So Ali's played Maria a couple of times since I've coached her. Um, one of my one of my best friends on tour was Maria's hitting partner um, all uh, for the last two years, Alex Kuznetsov. Um, to be honest, Maria is very um, nice sweet girl but very to herself um shows up practices leaves comes for her matches plays and leaves she's not very social she's not around very often um i don't really have anything good to tell you in terms of stories about her she's a very 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 private person very different to roger and rafa and, and novak and even serena or venus very um all those top players are very approachable. And um, I'd have to say Maria on the women's side is probably the least approachable female. Interesting. Yeah. Not in a bad way. Like that's just how she is. No. Maybe that's how she probably needs to be that way to compete her best. And that's fine. Yeah. All right. Can I do one? Yeah. All right. Let's jump over to doubles. Let's get some, uh, some Brian brothers. Got anything with them? Uh, So I I coached Rajiv Ram and Raven Klassen for um, almost two years, and they um, they were one of the top teams. Um, They made it the year in championships two years in a row. 
won Indian Wells as a team, actually beat beat Rafa in that tournament, um, beat Novak in that tournament. Um, so it was a good run for them. And um, they didn't play Mike and Bob there, but they ha- they did play Mike and Bob quite a few times. And um, the years that I was with them, I think that we went four and one against the Bryans. We only lost once against Mike and Bob. And we had a really good game plan against them, a lot of structure against the Bryans. And um, they used to like to give, you know, they give a, you know, everyone a hard time. That's just their personality. And there was one time I was at the U.S. Open. I was with Rajan Raven, but I was also coaching Dominic Kupfer at that time still. He was kind of coming up and he came for a training week. Um, he wasn't at, you know, playing in the U.S. Open, but he came to train there because I wanted him to see it and I wanted him to, you know, eventually know that he belonged at that level. So I was finishing up on the practice courts with Dom and Mike and Bob were hitting next to us. And, uh, Dom headed off. He had to go run somewhere, and I'll stick around. And, and um, Bob asked me if I wanted to play some baseline games, just like me versus him in singles, just baseline games. And um, I was like, yeah, sure, why not? I'm like, I don't know why you're playing these baseline games, but yeah. And uh, so we're playing a few, and um, I'm winning a few. He's winning a few. And um, we, he's like, all right, last one. And we play a last baseline game, and he absolutely kills me. And uh, – we're just sitting down. He's like, I can't tell you how good that felt to finally get a win over you. And it was just a little funny little thing. But, um, yeah, that's just kind of how those guys are. They're ultra competitive. Like, I don't even think in the, my wildest dreams would he even care to uh, – yeah, that's just how they are. But both of them are like that. They're both kind of um, ultra competitive. Super nice guys, though. And – holding a four and one record over them, like at any stretch in their careers, that's impressive. That's yeah. I mean, the, Raj and Raven matched up really well against them and uh, just kind of got on a little bit of a run and they were down, da- they were down for a little bit of time. They were struggling a bit with confidence and um, Bob was having a little back stuff. And so we did catch him at a good time, but yeah. Can you tell them apart if they're standing next to each other? Yeah. Okay. I've watched them enough. I've been, I mean, my players will tell you, I talk about the Bryans probably way too much. They're probably sick of it, but. (laughs) Yeah. They're good. um, They're two good guys to talk about though. Yeah. Just look for the one, the holding in the left hand, you know, it's Bob. Bob's heavier too. He's like 15 heavier than Mike. Yeah. A little little bit rounder in the face there. Yeah. But cool. So Back to uh, just kind of some some tennis advice. Um, I mean, do you have just like if you could boil it down to one thing? Do you have like one piece of advice that you would give to to junior players? Man, I think that would really depend on the level um, and the level that they wanted to get to. Um, so I think if 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 the goal is to if the goal is to have become good at a sport to play for the rest of your life then you have to fall in love with it and you have to love being on court and you have to enjoy the 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 dedication it takes to become really good that carries over um if you want to play in college tennis you have to find that joy to just do it consistently do it every day and know when to take time off if your if your body's not right if your mind's not right take a day take two days it's better to practice when you're fresh than to practice when you're um a little bit tired or fatigued because that's when you start to really create bad habits and that goes for anything in life if you're um if you're studying for finals or you're you're trying to complete a, a a project on time and and you start to get a little fatigued you start to take shortcuts to try and finish it and you start to try and find easier routes to complete a task instead of just maybe walking away from it for a day and coming back with a fresh approach and doing it the right way um tennis is similar like that um so there's a lot of carryover in tennis and in life that i, I think that's probably the most important thing i'd say is just understanding when you need to walk away and, and refresh yourself and then come back with, with, you know, everything you have from a um, concentration and focus standpoint. I like that. And, and that goes, that kind of ties into a question that uh, 
one of the girls who couldn't hop on this call sent me, she, she wanted me to ask what you would tell an athlete who struggles mentally before a match. Uh, I mean, the mental side of tennis is, is huge. We know that. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, if, if a player is struggling with anxiety or confidence or anything along those lines before any match, but especially before a big match, what, what do you tell them? Yeah. I mean, there's no, there, that, that's not an easy discussion. Um, there's no easy answer. I mean, Allie, there's a good article written about Allie last year that, um, I forget the title of it, but it's on, it's, I can send it to you after, but it, it basically spoke the idea of it was about how she's handling her anxiety better because she does get, she is like that. She gets super anxious. She gets super nervous. Um, and it's a constant battle. And it was like that today. Like it, it was kind of same old, nothing new. And she knew it and she hates it. I mean, she absolutely hates the fact that she gets like that, but she gets like that. And so we've really worked hard on um, accepting that we aren't going to necessarily change it but that we can fight it better and we can try and um, tame it better and um, get a hold of it quicker and not let it hold the same power over her for, you know, uh, try and, it's still gonna hold the power over her, but try and have it less and for a shorter period of time and her, her ability to fight her thoughts and her negative thoughts and replace them with positive thoughts, um, have that little battle happen less frequent. Um, but I think the biggest thing I, you know, it's a really simple thought and Michael Jordan and his, I don't know if you guys watched the last dance, but he had a really interesting line when, um, they're talking about how he was so successful taking the last shot in games. And if he ever gets nervous about it he, and said something to the effect of why would I be nervous about something that hasn't happened yet? And um, it was just a really interesting take on his mindset. Like he didn't worry about missing the shot because he hasn't taken the shot yet. And um, it's a similar approach in tennis. Like, why are you worried about playing a tennis match? You haven't played it yet. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what the outcome could be. So to really focus and control what's in your control. And, and um, at the end of the day, you just have to try and get a little bit better each time out there and, that doesn't always have to mean winning. It can, you can lose a match, but still get better. That, that's fantastic. And I look forward to, to that article. That sounds like a really good one there. Yeah, um, yeah it was interesting. It was well written, very well written. Cool. Uh, as far as the last dance goes, we're in Utah, so I didn't watch it. That's still painful memories for me. It's a shame. Uh, it's rough. You should watch it. Okay. Yeah. The, the jazz the um they go after the pistons a good bit um like the documentary and it, you know isaiah thomas doesn't come across as that well liked of a guy and and um but they uh they say a lot of good things about the jazz and Carmelo malone comes across as a great guy and um yeah they, they come out looking well even though they got beat they still you know present themselves well <laughs> all right all right i'll have to i'll have to check it out yeah um okay i have two more questions from players if you, are you still good on time you yeah, yeah of course okay um is there is there one thing that you wish players were taught earlier in their careers or, or just one thing that you wish players knew earlier earlier on um you know before they whether it's the juniors that you've worked with or the pros that you worked with is there something you wish that they knew earlier yeah how to compete like flat out if if kids knew, how, if any junior knew how to compete well, um, learning tennis and learning how to play tennis, if, if they're meant to be a tennis player, you have a certain talent inside of you. Um, and so if, if you have that talent to learn, the game is not difficult. Um, I find the tennis part of what I do really easy and making improvements with the players on the tennis court pretty easy. Um, but getting that compete level to a point where it is just brought every day, day in, day out, no matter what is the biggest challenge. And so if there's something that I, I, when I coached juniors and I had my academy, like we work tirelessly on how to compete. That's what a, a, the bulk of our conversations and our practices and everything about my academy was pretty big on how to compete and how tough to be as a competitor. And, um, 
like I said, I had a lot of success with juniors getting to number one in the country in their age group. And it was, they were by far the best competitors in their, um, in their classes. And, and it went on to, you know, a couple of them are playing pro tennis right now that I've worked with from when they were 13 years old and, um, and they're still great competitors. And so that aspect can definitely carry over. I like that. So follow-up question to that is, is how, how do you do that? How do you, if you, if you're not, you know, like for me, I've just, my whole life hated losing so much. I've always been competitive, but maybe you know, that might not even be what you're meaning here. Um, how, how do you learn to compete like that? I'll give you like, I'll give you an, an analogy. Um, and I think it's a lot to do with culture as well of tennis players, just tennis players in general, because it's an individual sport. It's very easy to give in a little bit and not put up such a fight because you don't have a teammate pushing you. You don't have a coach pulling you out of the game and putting you on the bench and putting someone else in because of lack of effort or bad attitude. You just lose the match and then you suffer alone and you have that inner dialogue with yourself and then eventually you get over it and then you just go and do it again and so it's kind of this vicious cycle and so it's a bit of culture in tennis and um, I'll give you an example in two sports so in basketball or soccer which are both team sports if picture a basketball player getting a foul and the first thing he does is look at the referee and go palms up and start complaining to the ref that was a bad call or you look at soccer and they get you know tackled uh, like a slide tackle and they're rolling around on the ground like they're dying and then all of a sudden 10 seconds later they're sprinting around the field like they're fine and um, if you watch hockey the culture in hockey is no matter what is going on you're just going to outwork your your competitor who you're who you're up against and you watch hockey they're up against the boards and you're getting hit and you're getting pinned against the boards and the guy's jamming a stick into your ribs and all you're doing is trying to work harder to get around that check and work harder to get the puck and work faster and be stronger, you never look at the ref for a call or complain. And that's the culture of that sport that they're gonna outcompete each other no matter what at all costs. And so if you look at all hockey players are generally super competitive guys and really gritty guys, and that's that it, it's demanded in that sport. And so I think tennis needs to change the culture a bit to get athletes to be a little bit tougher um, when things aren't going their way, instead of, you know, complaining about a ref missing a call or complaining about a bad line call or something like that, it's, um, you know, head down and, and not letting anything kind of knock you off your game. And, and to me, that's what playing a really good competitive match is that you don't let anything stop you from from performing your best, that you're able to calmly, you know, problem solve anything or calmly take any adversity in and push it away and continue to push forward with your best stuff. I like that. And it kind of goes back to what you're saying a minute ago um, with another answer where you say you control the things that are within your control. Yeah. Um, you focus on those and you can bring that focus and intensity um, yep. that you need. Right. Yeah. But it, it's tennis is a great sport for life too. Like no matter what you guys do, if, whether you play tennis or you, go to college or you get a really high, you know, stress job, whatever it is like that competitive aspect is always going to be there no matter what you do. And it's all about how you problem solve and respond and people who can problem solve and respond with a calmer and a clearer mind are going to be the most successful for sure. Great. Um, so one last question a player sent me and then Trent and Chaz, Isaac, Kayla, if you have any other questions, if, if you got some time, Billy, I'll, I'll yeah. kind of, let the four of you ask any questions you have, but um, what is a common characteristic or strength that you find in all the pro players you've worked with? And you may have already just answered that, but, but what, what is it? If there is one. Um, say so they are all very physically gifted. They're all really good athletes, very um, physically talented, some better than others, but, in tennis, it, it, you have to be a, a great mover. You have to have great balance. You have to be strong. You have to be really well conditioned. Um, so there's a certain level of physicality that's required to play the sport at the highest level. So that's probably the um, thing that's similar all across the board. Awesome. 
Well, thank you. Those are all the ones I got. Trenton, Chaz, Isaac, Kayla, do you have any questions for, for Billy here? Go for it, Trenton. Okay. Um, yeah. So I have a question. Um, so what annoys or frustrates you, um, you the most, I guess, like on court? As a coach or, or like when I was playing? When you were playing, yeah. So what annoys or frustrates me the most? Cool. Um, I haven't thought about myself as a player in a long time, so give me a second. <laughs> Very good. Um, it would really frustrate and annoy me when I knew I was playing really well in practice and I'd get into a match and early on in the match, it just wasn't, the ball wasn't quite coming off the same or I didn't have those same feelings and that same sensation that I had, you know, maybe a day ago in the practice court. Um, and I, I remember that used to really frustrate me a lot. And um, I wish I knew, you know, what I know now and I could have told that to myself back then, but I do remember, um, yeah, I could, I could, start to feel the ball so well in practice and um, just get a match and like I couldn't replicate it and it would, it would really bother me. I can relate. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, you're not alone. A lot of players, I think if they really thought about it, um, they'd give a similar answer. And um, the best advice I can give you is just every day is a new day and, and you're going to have different struggles daily. And that's kind of what makes tennis so much fun is that you know, one day you could be thinking one thing about your forehand and the next day that just doesn't work anymore and you have to figure out a new thing to try and a new thing to think about mm -hmm. a new subtle change. And, um, you know, I, a lot of players, everyone I coach keeps a journal and writes down things after every practice and every match and that seems to work well. When things aren't going well, we're able to go back to a certain time. And I know in Wuhan last year, Allie was hitting her forehand great. So I can go back to my notes. She can go back to her journal and we can look up, you know, I organize mine by tournaments. She organizes hers just by dates. I can tell her, hey, look at these dates and what were you writing down about your forehand? What were you thinking? And then we can take that on the practice court and try and get back in that mindset. So that's worked really well in, um, for me with the players I've worked with. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from any of you? Doesn't look like they're going off mute. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I have Billy. a question. Oh, go for it, Kayla. So is there any habit that you as a player or you as a coach would, have, would want your uh, players to be doing like something? Is there anything that like helps them? throughout practice like whether it's like doing a specific stretch or is there anything that like would improve yeah so anyway in practice yeah I mean obviously the pros are are very very dialed in with like Ali and Dom have obviously they have myself as their tennis coach they have a full-time mental performance coach they have a full-time nutritionist they have a full-time physio they have a full-time strength coach they have a big team around them that, you know, takes all that guesswork out of it. So they have their, you know, morning routines that they do to get their bodies right. They have their protocols they go through before practice to, to get activated. They have their cool down. So from a physical standpoint, they're all very dialed in. They know what food they're supposed to be eating. Um, they know what drinks and electrolytes and different mixes they're supposed to be putting in their body. So it's very science driven. Um, from that aspect, from my, my aspect, I think the most important thing is to have a really good understanding of your game and create practice plans with your coach um, and really make sure that you're addressing one or two things every day in practice and you're trying to improve them. I think that's the best habit that you can create is that practices are very um, structured and um, well thought out and they're, um, they're meant to try and improve things every day. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Thanks. That was good. Any other questions for Billy here? Okay. Well, Billy, 
can't thank you enough. This has been yeah, awesome. Course. Yeah, no problem. This is uh, this is one I'm excited to share with the rest of the the players that couldn't make it today. Um, thank you to you four for hopping on um, yeah, and for the okay. questions. Um, but but seriously, Billy, this is some great insights, some great stories, and great things we're going to take away and uh, improve as a team from here. I like it. Cool. Awesome. We'll keep in touch and definitely let me know how uh, everything goes with uh, – when are you guys getting back to school? So school's done for the year now, um, but they're, right. they're on tr – everything seems to be on track for fall for okay. things to open up. Good. So – which is good because our girls' season is in the fall, <laughs> so yeah. we uh, we got to get back on court. We got some some championship-minded goals for that cool. team. I, li I like it. But yeah, we'll keep you posted. And, and thanks again, yeah. Billy. <laughs> uh, you're the man. Appreciate it. We'll be yeah. cheering for for Allie a lot going forward here. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, we'll see ya. All right. Thanks, everybody. See ya. Bye.